Yeah, so welcome everybody. This is the, um, the, the first pitch set session. Um, I'm your moderator, so I'm Julia Patberg of Set Ventures, which again is not uh, the same as the Set Tech Festival, but uh, we are a smart energy um, uh, technology ventures based in Amsterdam. And we invest all over Europe in smart solutions that are accelerating the energy system transition. Um, so yeah, we have a couple of very interesting startups here from all over the world that were selected to pitch here um, very quickly. So it's three minutes per pitch. And then afterwards, there's two minutes for uh, questions. So um, yeah, to the audience, please send me uh, the questions in the chat and then I will uh, try to ask them to the startups after their pitch. Um, and also a reminder to all the startups to mute themselves unless if they're pitching to avoid any background noise. And for the audience, uh, please switch between, so toggle between the presentation or the speaker to enlarge the screens. Uh, and finally, everybody just have fun. This uh, pitch session is for fun. So um, let's uh, quickly go to the first one. Um, so for this first pitch, uh, we're immediately going out to space as this startup gets most of its data from satellites circling around the Earth. Um, so if you're very curious about how they monetize this data, then please listen carefully to Sven of LiveEO. Yes. Hello. Thank you very much for giving us this opportunity. And I think without further ado, I'm going to start in this quick pitch. Um, yes, I'm Sven, co-founder of LiveEO. And what LiveEO does is we help to keep uh, 30 million kilometers of infrastructure grids safe. Um, as I said, there are more than 30 million kilometers of infrastructure grids spanning the globe. We're talking about the railway system, electricity overhead lines, and pipelines. These infrastructure grids really um, make our modern life possible. And because they are so crucial to our daily activities, they are monitored and maintained quite frequently. And during the last few years, there has been a revolution of Earth observation. Um, now, every place on Earth is monitored in high frequency and with high accuracy. Um, from space with satellite imagery. And what LiveView does is we combine these two facts. We bring Earth observation data to enterprise customers in the utility sector. By monitoring infrastructure grids from space, we help to increase grid uptime, efficiency, and we have to decrease costs. Because right now, a lot of money is spent on infrastructure, money, maintenance, and monitoring. Right now, people walk alongside these grids, they fly these grids, or um, the drive alongside these grids to make sure that no external threats are harming the integrity of these networks. And what we can do from space is the following. We can monitor ground deformation underneath and next to pipelines and railway systems with millimeters of accuracy. We can monitor how precisely where third parties are interacting with pipelines. And what we can do is we can identify where vegetation is, vegetation is encroaching into uh, the right of way of overhead lines. And in the US alone, more than 6 billion US dollars are spent every year on vegetation management. And still, we see wildfires happening on a, uh, on a high frequent basis, which are caused by vegetation. What we can do is we identify precisely where actions are required and we break this down into actionable insights, which then can be used by people on site. We're the first ca company who has analyzed entire countries, our infrastructure grids spanning entire countries, 33,000 kilometers. And we have implemented the solution with full on, on a full grid DSO level and helped to save 35% of OPEX. Our customers are in Europe, uh, North America, and Australia. And we've been able to build up this uh, unique technology over the past two years by raising a 1.5 million euros equity round and additionally uh, 2.1 uh, million euros in public funding. Um, Right now, we are raising our next round because our goal is to monitor every major infrastructure around the planet. So I'm ha very happy to have this opportunity here and I'm happy to answer all questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so I don't see any questions from the audience in the chat um, yet. So please, if you have a question, then ask it in the, in the chat and otherwise I will start with a question. Um, do you believe that there, at some point there will be some commoditization in using free satellite data? And if so, what is your strategy to go about this? 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I believe satellite data will become a commodity and we are very happy about this. Right now, we have an early mover advantage in accessing the satellite data. We're not talking only about like uh, freely available satellite data, such as from the European Commission, but we're talking also about commercial satellite data. Right now, it's still quite hard to get it, but it will be a commodity. And we believe our USP, no, we are convinced that our USP doesn't rely on uh, being the only company who accesses this data, but we are really good in accessing and combining different data sources on large scale. We're talking here about country scale, applying analytics in a unique way, and then translating the insights of our analytical process steps really into the work processes of these companies by inter, uh, integrating this data, for example, into an SAP or Info uh, Asset Management System or providing our own workforce management system. So it's really this entire uh, pipeline, analysis pipeline, and not the access to the data. Okay, thanks. Then one more question from the audience. What do you believe are the most important uh, infrastructures that your technology will serve to keep operational? Yeah, so right now we focus on electricity grids, oil and gas pipelines and railways. And obviously they are all hugely important to our daily activities, but uh, we are also um, looking at, uh, for example, um, water infrastructure, which, which provides us with, with clean, clean water. Uh, but we also have already analyzed all kinds of other infrastructure grids. We're talking here about, for example, dams, bridges, streets. Um, right now our offering is targeted at utilities and really this is where we see a huge customer uptake and a great momentum on global scale. Uh, but really there's no limits uh, behind this. And right now our business development team is, is ex uh, assessing which area is the best one to move into next. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, then uh, let's go to the next one. Uh, so the next startup is from Colombia. Um, and they say that they bring industrial assets to life. Uh, so please listen to Oscar Hoyos Vasquez, uh, who explains how he optimizes the operational and energy efficiency of these of this equipment using artificial intelligence. Thanks, Julia. Uh, can you hear me well? Yeah, perfect. Great, thanks. So, as Julia said, my name is Oscar Hoyos. I'm from Colombia, and I'm the co-founder and CEO at Uptime Analytics. And in Uptime, we optimize energy-consuming assets, and currently our growth rate over month is around 30%. I would, I would like to begin with the problem we're attacking, and according to the International Energy Outlook uh, from 2019, industry consumes more than 50% of the energy in the world. Despite technologies, advancements, asset intensive companies keep having the same questions. How can I save more energy? When will the next failure occur? Is my equipment performing well enough? In Uptime Analytics, we work with the terabytes of data that equipment generates to empower engineers with the right information at the right time to maximize equipment production output. Our technology is based on analytical models. We work with industrial kilns, boilers, transformers, hydros, uh, combustion engines, uh, among other types of equipment, uh, and we help them decrease energy consumption, predict failures, and recommend settings that optimizes plant performance. As an example, we're working with one of the biggest steel companies in Latin America, and we have helped them save between 15 to 20 percent their energy consumptions and their CO2 emissions by using our AI models and domain knowledge. Today, our customers has reduced his uncertainty and increased his production in a more sustainable way. Uptime Analytics was born out of passion for equipment and analytics. In the one hand, we have uh, reliability energy engineers, and on the other one, software and data engineers and data scientists. And we have come together to change the way decisions are made in the industry. My brother, uh, Luis, is the other co-founder. He's the maintenance and reliability expert with more than 13 years of experience in the field. I am a mechanical engineer that has worked in the field for more than uh, 12 years and I've been an entrepreneur for eight years. Uh, and my passion is to use technology and new business models to, the, to transform the energy industry. Uh, we are uptime analytics and our purpose is to build a sustainable world that always works. And I'm open for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, that was well within the time. Um, again, I don't see any questions from the audience yet. So please put, submit your question in the chat. Um, yeah, my, my personal question to you would be, how do you do this? So growing 30% each month, is that because you went from zero revenue uh, two months ago? Or uh, what's your go-to-market strategy for, for growing so quickly? 
so so first of all we attack the market by type of equipment so for example we, we had a pilot that just ended uh, a couple of months ago uh, for the kiln industry and you find kilns in the ceramic steel industry and cement industry and what we do is uh, is is once we are successful with one we can go and deploy our solution and the onboarding will take uh, two between three to four weeks or, or at latest five weeks and we can bring on board several clients uh, at one same month and give them values since month two so that way because we already know what variables we need to go get and we, we already know what models work to decrease the energy consumption so that helps us move fast and scale fast and that okay. we do that by, by, by other by doing the same thing to other types of equipment such as boilers transformers uh, and we scale by by type of equipment and what would you say is your biggest bottleneck or your biggest challenge for for growth i think that today like um like we're based in colombia and um and we are uh, we're giving great results but sometimes industry here is not well developed in terms of censoring and sometimes the data is not there so it we need to have um uh, the, our customers need to first censor their equipment uh, because it's not ready to be analyzed. But we have found that in other countries, uh, there, ha there, ha there is a more developed technology that can push our, our growth faster. Yeah. One question from the audience. So what key analytics do you find provides the largest savings? So it depends on the problem. We have run deep learning, uh, we have run clustering, uh, and we have run simple regressions. So uh, depending on the problem, we have a library of models. And uh, for example, for kilns, uh, deep learning has worked very well and we uh, reduce energy consumption by maintaining quality of the output of the, of the, of the product. So, so it's not just re reduce consumption by reducing it, by, but we have a very focus on maintaining quality, which is very important as well. Great. Okay. Thank you very much, Oscar. Uh, then we go to the next company, which is on the other side of the world, uh, Singapore. So uh, they claim that they have the most advanced indoor air sensor, which is of course very relevant right now in these COVID times. Uh, I had a look at their website and it looks very cool. It's a really a design sensor, but yeah, the main question is of course, why it's so advanced. So uh, yeah, please listen to Dustin of Uho. Hi everyone. Uh, our company is called Yuhu, by the way. Oh, sorry, and Yuhu. No worries. <laughs> All good. Yeah, nice to meet everybody. So our company is called Yuhu, and we're your first step to clean air. Uh, the problem that we see today is that poor air quality indoors is a significant health concern, and it is the world's largest environmental hazard. It impacts the comfort, health, and safety of people both at home and in the workplace. And science has actually proven that and shown that air indoors is up to five times worse than outdoors. And with this type of poor air, it, it affects your health at home and also productivity in the workplace. In fact, it would it cost you $1,000 per employee per year due to loss in productivity. And poor indoor air is also a main cause of headaches, fatigue, and nausea. And it also increases the risk of the coronavirus surviving and spreading and becoming airborne inside your workplace or inside your home. And so we created Yuhu to address these issues. Uh, this is Yuhu. Uh, this is the hardware that we have. All you have to do is to plug it in for power, connect it to your Wi-Fi network, and we would be able to con continuously monitor all the important things in the air so you know exactly what to do to improve it. We are the most comprehensive or most advanced sensor in the market because we measure the most number of parameters. We measure nine parameters so that it gives you a very comprehensive view of what you need to know so that action can be taken. We provide you all your real time and historical data in any location that you have in your home or in your workplace, and you can manage them from the app or if you're a business customer from a dashboard. You would also get alerts if in case uh, the air quality exceeds safety thresholds. In order to fight the coronavirus, we also launched the Yuhu Virus Index uh, three months ago. And what we provide with this is a real-time risk assessment of the coronavirus surviving and becoming airborne. And the way we view air today is that buildings are moving from just being energy efficient, but to being healthy as well. And when you're a healthy building, you have all the air quality parameters in there, which can be used as an input 
and adjusting the building systems, thereby increasing energy savings as well inside your building. And as of today, we already have tens of thousands of happy customers uh, in homes, in businesses, and in government. And so we also invite you to come join us in our journey in making the world one healthier, one breath at a time. Thank you. Thank you. So first uh, question from the audience, which is actually one of the other startups here in the room, I see, um, is where does this analysis happen? Is it on the device or as on the edge or in the cloud? Uh, we do it on the cloud. Okay, great. And um, who do you sell to within the, the building value chain? Uh, in the building value chain, we sell to the real estate developer. So it's the owner of the building. So that's one aspect. And the other side of it would be the occupier as well, wherein the tenants, but they don't really work with the building directly. So we work with the tenants when they do their own initiatives floor by floor. And so it's, it's both retrofit and new build. Yes, that's correct. Because it's plug yeah. and play. You can just uh, put it on the desk and or mount yeah. it on the wall. Yeah. Um, and what is the actual or target price of your device? Sorry, come again. Duh. What's, the, what's the price? Uh, you can buy it online for home consumers, 329 US dollars from our website. Or in Europe, you can buy it at 329 euros in different stores. And of okay. course, for our business solution, the pricing is different because the whole software behind it is different as well. Yeah. Um, and is there any energy efficiency components as well, apart from the, the air quality aspect? Yes. So in terms of energy efficiency, the way buildings are managed today, it's primarily focused on just let's make it more just energy efficient without taking into consideration the comfort and health and safety of occupants inside the building. But right now it has to be balanced. In fact, when we look at trends on healthy buildings, healthy buildings become more energy efficient than just green buildings. And at the same time, yeah. it gives value on health and safety as well. So that, that's what that's the value we provide to our clients. Okay, well, thanks a lot. Uh, then we move to the next one, which All is right. a company Thank from you. Taiwan. Thanks. Uh, so a company from Taiwan, uh, it's called Nivo Up, and they, uh, they make extremely fast charging batteries, which apparently charge 10 times faster than normal batteries, and they have a three times longer lifetime. So I'm very curious to hear more from BJ Byrne. Hello, my name is BJ. So is my mic is working well? Hello? Yeah, it's working. Okay, good. So my name is BJ and the CEO of Nivo. Nivo, uh, uh, like uh, Julia just said, is uh, definitely the to in uh, success to su successfully commercialize stream fast charging battery or just simply put uh, SFC battery. As you see by the uh, by the photo in the middle, yeah, our stream fast charging battery can be recharged ten times faster, uh, three times long, uh, lasting three times three times longer without without a cost increase. Well, we produce this uh, battery on an active material agnostic manufacturing platform within the core of the design process. Uh, yeah, if you uh, happen to watch uh, uh, Battery Day hosted by Tesla, well, uh, just imagine to re-engineer the process step right before Maxwell's uh, dry electro process. Well, so simply put, uh, both the Tesla and, and, and the industry um, have uh, overlooked uh, this potential. So uh, as we speak, um, our team is uh, working closely with uh, one of the global uh, aircraft manufacturers here in Europe uh, on a hybrid electric uh, airplane project, which will demand um, the propelling engine to charge the battery 10 times faster, right? <laughs> After taking off. So uh, we'll be leveraging this uh, uh, every project to drive the technology, our technology roadmap and expand our uh, entry to other you know, heavy duty uh, segments such as uh, you know, hybrid battery vessel or maybe e-truck. On the competition, uh, all of our competitors are uh, Many of them, a couple of them, you know, raising already um, more than 100 million dollars, are still at least, at least uh, two years behind us. Um, and a short introduction of our team, uh, 
we are we have uh, more than 60 years of uh, proven experience in scaling up uh, the key word is uh, scaling up the battery process in Taiwan and we also have uh, a CEO now in Frankfurt to work with the customer here in Europe so if you would like to check out the data testing data uh, ask me or him for for the report so if I may conclude our grand value proposition um, our extreme fast charging platform will complement the holistic electrification mission with an extreme fast charging modality, which will also differentiate our uh, differential level up against uh, what others, uh, including Tesla, uh, will be offering. So now I open to code questions. Thank you. Uh, so to the audience, if there are any questions, please submit them in the chat. Um, so uh, yeah, I was wondering about your your commercial traction. Where are you now in in the production and selling of your products? Yeah, we we, we are shipping sample. Uh, our sample already had reaching a size a capacity of a six to seven m hour, and uh, uh, ten times normally we call it a ten c rate. You know, ten, one c is called like a charging by one hour. So ten c is like charging in six minutes up to uh, 80 to 90 percent full of the you know six or seven and out capacity uh, like, like i just uh, described and we are working closely with uh, one of these uh, aircraft manufacturer here in uh, europe and that's the way we are and uh, we hope this will, will be the technology driver to take us to other segments which will be less demanding on the ch uh, charging side but may want to ask for more higher energy density and are you going to focus on one segment in the first years or will you immediately uh, then go to a, a lot of different sectors with your technology? Yeah, we probably had to do it at the same time because uh, this aircraft project will take uh, three or four years. So, uh, but uh, the, the goodness of this project, like I said, this is a technology driver. They'll be the most demanding. So they'll be asking for the highest uh, charging rate. Uh, they may not need as, a high, uh, as high energy density. But at the same time, we can adjust the energy density a little bit higher. But for other mm -hmm. segments, they will be requiring uh, less demanding uh, charging rate. So probably in a six, typically for each technology generation, I would say three months or six months later, when we serve the first customer in the aircraft, then we can go to the next uh, segment. Yeah. One question from the audience. Uh, does the battery degrade more from accelerated charging? Oh, of course, of course. but uh remember when we said we have a uh, three times longer life and uh, if you remember you know before this uh, battery that people are wondering you know, whether tesla will have this one million one million mile uh, battery uh, they didn't announce the one million mile but we did a uh, exercise by for ourselves so if we apply the same formula apply the same uh, battery management system uh to protect a battery our battery will have a uh, 1.5 million mile battery life we have one more technical question from the audience. Uh, to what extent does your battery overcome the low volumetric energy density issue? And how do you see it in relation to hydrogen fuel cell technology? Uh, I think we're gonna, we're gonna kind of like, uh, uh, okay, this, go, this become a truck, uh, truck, uh, uh, the, the truck back battery pack slicing versus uh, the payroll in the truck. So I think we're gonna, fit very nicely in the spot where you're going to have a smaller pack with our technology, higher payroll, but you probably had to use the ABB uh, megawatt charger, maybe the bigger one of uh, ABB. So then uh, you have a, you know, a memory of this uh, super high power charger and our battery kind of taking the lower end, I, I said me to lower end uh, market segment, which uh, people presume uh, hydrogen will take. So. Uh, for the very high end, the uh, most heavy one, the uh, most long haul one, you're you thinking about like 1,000 uh, mile per charge uh, or 1,000 per charge from hydrogen with the uh, uh, highest payroll. Well, I don't think we'll be there, but for the 500 mile uh, with the two charger, uh, by the ABB charger, uh, two megawatt, three megawatt charger with our battery pack, uh, I think we should be, we should be uh, pretty well uh, fit in, into that particular segment. Uh, it's like, it's that kind of question, that question. Is yeah, that, we, is I think question? we have to, 
Yeah, I think we, we have to wrap it up now. So I, I do see some more questions from the audience, but I think we ran out of time. Uh, so we have to move to the next startup. But thanks very much. Very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, OK. Uh, the next one, uh, so we'll stay with energy storage. Uh, it's a German eco-friendly, cost-efficient and highly scalable modular thermal energy storage system um, is what I, I read from their pitch deck. So uh, Martin Schichtel, please tell us more about Craftblock. Thank you very much, Julia. Hello, everybody. I'm Martin, founder and CEO of Craftblock. And at Craftblock, we strongly believe in a sustainable energy system where storage are essential. So our high performance heat storage is able to indefinitely will decarbonize industries like steel, glass, ceramics, petrochemical industries, and a couple of more. It will even help renewables to have their breakthrough in industrial heating. You might imagine our storage a little bit like a safe for energy. So we recover excess or waste heat or excess energy, put it into our storage and utilize it whenever it's necessary. Sounds like a simple process, and it is of course, but this has a huge impact as we drastically uh, cut down the usage of fossil fuels, which also means we avoid carbon dioxide formation and we increase the value of formerly lost and wasted heat. You can see in the middle of our slide a picture where you can recover waste heat in high temperature potential. High temperature for us means 500 degrees C to 1300 degrees C. This is just a flare gas deck burning in steel industry and together with the uh, gas and oil industry, there's so much heat just flared into the air that you could supply the whole German industry with heat quite easily. So if we would be only able to recover one third of this energy, we could cut down emissions by 3% and save 30 billion euro every year. And of course, there are a couple of competitors moving in the market. One of them we usually meet in Europe is EnergyNet. They're doing a very well job on temperatures up to 500 degrees C, 600 degrees C but it's fairly not enough to recover the high temperature resources as we did. So we go up to 1,300 degrees C. If you compare the storage units, 20 foot container energy is purely stores 1.5 megawatt hour. This is only one tenth of the energy we can put in the same container size. So having those advantages and a couple of more, we were already able to sell three pilots to those industries, which have to be decarbonized fastest, glass, steel, as well as ceramics industry. Furthermore, a couple of weeks ago, we released the first world's heat to go project with a high temperature storage. Yeah, means we recover heat between 500 and 1000 degrees okay, okay, into our storage to, to, to another Go location and utilize the heat there as a for very affordable prices. And of course, we can't do this work by our own. So my co-founder Susanne and me, so we formed a team of very, very good and skilled young engineers. You can see them in the, in the bottom line. Uh, and together we all follow our mission that we believe in a sustainable energy system where storage are essential. So having this world-class art A team, also the troubleshooter solution for a couple of problems during decarbonization, that's fairly not enough. We also need you in the audience, if you are a customer, if you are a supplier, only if you can put the system to the market, get it to the application, we will have the impact everybody needs. Thank you very much. Thanks, Martin. Uh, so again, the audience can ask questions in the chat box. Um, so yeah, my first question would be, um, yeah, how much capital do you think is required for bringing this uh, to market and then to exit eventually? We actually, we are ab absolutely happy that we closed the series A a couple of weeks ago. So we got the necessary money to do the scalation for our systems means we extend our engineering teams, we scale our production. And at the moment, our production is at that level that we can fabricate one container every second week. So we, were, we have a very stable uh, substance at the moment. Great. And what is your plan for the, the coming 12 months on how to, how to ramp up sales and production? Yeah, we, um, we have built storage in the range of four megawatt hour to six megawatt hour at the moment. And we are aiming for three more projects up to the 40 to 50 megawatt hour range. And that's what we focus on. So the production really is tailored to, to getting those projects running. Wow. Um, one question from the audience. Uh, what temperature can you sustain and for how long? Uh, we can, the systems limit at the moment is set to 1,300 degrees C. Our material itself, it's a newly developed material, easily can take 1,500 degrees C. And for how long? 
that's a, a sentence uh, engineers love depends just depends on the type of insulation and how thick the insulation is so for mobile systems we recommend to cycle them two times a week so and stationary systems up to let's say large scale system 100 megawatt hour 200 megawatt hour up to three weeks and then it's still economic feasible okay and one more question from the audience uh, what is the typical payback for your system um mostly lower than three years two to three years in general okay that sounds good um well if there are no further questions then thanks very much martin you're welcome uh, the next company is from Canada um, and they uh, have an end-to-end -end energy efficiency program for utilities. Uh, so Nishant, please explain us what, what this entails. Thanks, Julia. Hi, my name is Nishant Sangvi. I'm one of the founders and the CEO of EnergyX. So the mission of EnergyX is to really empower every building around the world with a very relevant and personalized energy savings plan so they can take action. In a nutshell, we make energy decisions easy. And we've built the company based on three uh, philosophies or truths that we believe in. The first and foremost, we believe that energy conservation and efficiency is the most effective way for, to hit, for us to hit our climate change goals and targets. The second truth we believe in is that if you empower homes and businesses with data about their buildings, they're more likely to take action towards energy efficiency. Um, and the third truth we believe in is that by digitizing the entire customer experience and adopting energy efficiency programs, utilities can become a trusted advisor to their customers and keep their customers sticky. Now, the problem we solve is twofold. On the utility side, we know utilities around the world are running energy efficiency programs. In the US alone, last year, close to $8 billion was spent on energy efficiency programs. But we know two things. We know these energy efficiency programs are not very cost effective. In certain cases, it costs you more than $1,000, uh, for uh, at least $10,000 per participant. And uh, the second thing we know that in many cases, energy efficiency programs are also not that successful and don't hit their targets. From a customer perspective, we know customers around the world are looking for rebates, they're looking for incentives, but they don't know what they qualify for. And we also know customers around the world want to lower the energy bills, but they don't know what to do. And now you couple in government regulations, electrification, decarbonization, the focus on deep retrofits. And this is exactly where our solution plays a role. Through our machine learning algorithms and platform retrofit AI, we can virtually audit an entire utilities customer base. We can help them segment their customers and we can help them take a very proactive approach towards approaching their customers and, and helping their customers with energy efficiency. Through our online customer engagement platform, My Energy Expert, we can help utilities digitize the entire customer experience. Homes and businesses can go online, enter information about their buildings, and then be directed to the right incentives and rebates that they qualify for. And through our program manager platform, we can operationalize the entire backend uh, processes of the utility and help them track program success. So in a nutshell, we do provide an end-to-end -end platform for utilities so they can automate and manage energy efficiency programs. So these programs are cost effective, they're successful, and they can hit their targets. And in the same token, we help homes and businesses lower energy usage, become more educated about what they can do in their building to lower energy and to save money. Now, we started EnergyX in 2016. We've uh, expanded and, and, and um, our annual recurring revenue has increased by 50 times. We're currently working with 16 utilities in the US and Canada and have licensed our technology to them. We're working, starting to work in Europe, which goes to show we're really solving a global problem. We've got 25 co-workers and we've been in the process of raising our Series A so we can grow the team and empower every building with energy efficiency. Thanks, very interesting. Um, so can you say a bit more about your, your USP? So what's the main differentiation of Energy X versus uh, competitors? Because we've, we've seen quite a few companies in this space. Yeah, that's a great question. And, and the way we like to describe that is really the end to end. We've seen competitors come in in various different angles. We've seen competitors that come in and just help uh, provide utilities with a digital uh, customer engagement platform. We've, come, we've seen utilities that come in and help utilities on the program automation, back end processes. And we've seen ut uh, competitors that come in and provide disaggregation and help utilities understand customer behavior. Well, we've really taken and expanded that piece of the pie, right? We understand that energy efficiency programs are not really hitting their targets. We also understand that utilities have to be much more proactive. So through our, through our AI machine learning algorithms, we help utilities 
virtually audit that entire customer base, identify which customers can 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 qualify for which programs, and then we digitize that experience. So it's providing that end-to-end -end, uh, uh, ability for utilities to run and automate the programs is where we feel we differentiate ourselves. It's not a piecemeal, it's a very much a plug and play, and then we've got integration. Yeah. And as, is this, as well is this well. purely a B2B2C solution or is it also B2B2B? Yeah, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, it's, it's, it's a B2B2C solution, uh, especially when it comes to the customer mm -hmm. engagement digitization play. Um, there's, there's B2B elements of it, which is really focused on the program automation. But if I have to look at the solution end to end, there's very much a B2C play. At the end of the day, you do want to engage homes and businesses and you do want them to start saving energy. And to do that, you've got to have that enterprise platform that utilities yeah. can white label license. And so license you're, you're and selling, in effect, to utilities, which are known to be quite slow. So how are your sales cycles looking? That's an awesome question. Uh, you know, they are, they, are, they are slow, but I'll tell you two things about utilities. Number one, when they make a decision, they stick with you all the way through. So we've got very sticky customers. Um, and number two, because we've got a plug and play with the AI machine learning modules, we can actually start working with utilities without a lot of integration, which shortens the sales cycle. Sales cycles for us is anywhere between eight to 12 months, uh, I would see on the shorter end. And if I've seen some longer deals, they would go anywhere from around 16 to okay. 18 months. Thanks a lot. I see no further questions from the audience. So let's move to the next one. Um, this is a Pakistan-based off-grid energy company that is famous globally, as it was featured in the National Geographic, in the Huff Huffington Post, USA Today and many more global media. Um, so I'm very curious what, what differentiates them. Um, yeah, so uh, Shazia Khan, uh, yeah, please explain us about eco energy. Hi, so a uh, little bit of a change that I think wasn't communicated. Uh, I'm Faiz, I'm from Eco Energy, Shazia. Yeah, sure. And I think our slide's the next one. Uh, you're from Eco Energy, right? Yeah. Yes. So uh, I, yeah. All right. Uh, hi, yes. everyone. I'm, I'm Faiz. Uh, a lot of the stuff that I put on this slide, I think it's gotten minimized to the point that it's not really legible, but I will try and make the best out of it. So the point that we are trying to make is that Karachi and Pakistan, where we operate, are really population dense uh, places. So Karachi is probably the biggest city in the world by many metrics. And there are a lot of areas there which are extremely high density and most of the people living in those areas are very low income. And uh, since our inception eight years ago, Eco Energy has served around 25,000 customers who live in these sorts of locations and in rural areas as well, uh, not just uh, urban slums. And uh, we've served them with off-grid systems. We've uh, moved into uh, like standalone solar systems from anywhere from one kilowatt to 35 kilowatts, depending upon whether we're uh, going after commercial customers who run some things like rice mills or floor mills, or whether we're serving domestic customers whose energy demand is somewhere in the ballpark of 100 uh, watt hours, oh, sorry, 100 watts, uh, like 100 watt hours per day. And uh, through this experience, what we've realized is that the diff like the differentials in the market are basically the things that aren't being uh, capitalized upon properly. So what we've been working on for the last year is a project called Dosti, which in Urdu means friendship. And our purpose is basically that we want end-to-end -end communal, communal electrification of high density and low income areas. And uh, when we say end-to-end, -end, we mean something a little bit different from what Nishant meant in the sense that uh, we start with the grids for, for a particular community. We start with figuring out what the grid size should be in order to fulfill the energy demand of that particular community. We figure out the transmission network layout because a lot of these communities are off grid and don't have any direct access to the grid. Even if they do, even if they are grid connected, they get uh, load shedding for up to 18 hours a day throughout the year. So it's almost like they're not really connected to the grid anyways. So uh, we start off with a gr with grid sizing and a transmission network layout. We then uh, help them out by installing uh, commodity hardware in order to fulfill their demand. And by commodity hardware, I mean here solar panels, batteries, and uh, inverters, and also uh, DC, DC or DC converters, uh, depending upon what sort of loads they have. We provide them with uh, monitoring through your usual uh, IoT-based uh, 
an IoT based system, which, all, which is also capable of working completely off grid in the sense that we can just attach a tiny real Raspberry Pi to it and scale up the monitoring to up to 10,000 clients at a particular point in time. We haven't really gotten to the 10,000 clients point yet, but that's the scalability that we have like embedded in our system because uh, we see ourselves going into very high density areas very quickly. And uh, once the hardware is installed and the monitoring is up and running, uh, we, on top of that, we, we're in the process currently of setting up an energy market which also runs on these Raspberry Pis and uh, allows people to transact over the grid that we've set up for them uh, in the uh, with the amount of energy that they uh, want to consume. And this is basically where the differentials come in uh, and uh, large producers such as commercial installations with mills and such are able to sell uh, the excess energy that they produce to households around them and even in like trading in between households is something that takes place. In order to facilitate this, we have an optimal dispatch uh, algorithm that's running, which basically does a few things that are more or less standard by this point in time uh, in terms of industry practice. So we have a battery management system, which figures out how much uh, energy is stored across the grid. We have a demand uh, calculator, which uh, looks at the demand profile of various, uh, of all of the participants of the uh, grid in order to figure out what their long-term patterns are and how we can accommodate them. And uh, once we have supply and demand, we're able to figure out an optim optimal dispatch, which minimizes the energy loss uh, per transaction for uh, the grid that we've set up. Uh, on top of this, we also have uh, flex flexible payment plans built into like entire, our entire pipeline. So this goes for like standalone solar installations all the way up to like individual energy transactions on the microgrids. So uh, in our terms, the end-to-end -end system is basically when we approach a community in order to electrify them, we uh, work with them all, uh, all across the uh, process of getting them set up with a sustainable energy source on, through which they can also monetize their investment by uh, selling the energy that they produce to uh, other people around them. Uh, yeah, so that's basically it. Thanks. So yeah, again, any questions from the audience are welcome. Uh, my first question would be, what is the what's the the payback time of your, of your solution? So uh, the payback time, like uh, if you take a, a like in general, a, if somebody purchases up to like a one kilowatt hour to two kilowatt hour system, the uh, with enough storage to last them an entire like a, a battery day, so that. Uh, sort of like of according to the prices in the market in Pakistan and given the policies of like the the, uh, the larger grids for the sorry the utilities for um, buying like buying the excess energy uh, we, we get sort of like a six a six to seven year period for the uh, break even point for their investment uh, with, with energy markets on top we're trying to minimize that to two to three years. So uh, like the value add that we can directly give the customers on top of individual solar systems is we can, like what we're trying to do right now is to get from uh, a situation where they have six to seven years of uh, break even to go and get that down to two to three years. Great, thanks. And currently you're mainly focused on Pakistan. Do you have also plans to expand outside of that? So uh, I think at this point in time, like the, the technology is fairly like everything uh, that is plugged into the technology is more, more or less generic, right? So we can we 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 work with all all kinds of batteries, lithium ion, uh, lead acid, uh, and we work with all sorts of inverters, uh, commodity inverters. We work with uh, all sorts of solar panels. So there's nothing that stops us from growing, except for the fact that Pakistan is a very 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 large market, and there are a lot of underserved people here. So Karachi in, in it, like alone is a city of 30 million people. And out of those 30 million, around 25 million of those people are basically underserved as with regards to energy. So uh, at this point in time, like what we're looking at is uh, more capital in order to expand our presence in the largest city in Pakistan and hopefully uh, move, moving from that point onwards to places outside of Pakistan who have similar dynamics and uh, yeah. Yeah, I can see in the questions that there's already demand from Africa as well. So uh, hopefully you can grow fast in Pakistan and then move beyond that. Um, I think we're out of, of time now for this one. So thank you very much. Um, then we go to the next one. It, this is a very innovative on-site solar energy system. 
uh, from a country with lots of sun. Um, so Alex Brill, can you please explain us about Solar Latam from Argentina? You are still on mute, it seems. I cannot hear you yet. Not sure if there are technical issues. Can anyone else hear Alex? No. Um, in that case, maybe let's first move to another one and then in the end we go back to you, Alex. Is that fine? Um, okay, then the next one is an asphalt coating company that can reduce global warming. Uh, it's uh, called ePave from the USA. So, Clara uh, Muradkan, can you please explain us? Yes. Uh, do you have my slide up for ePave? No, no, currently we're seeing Solar Latin, but we could not hear Alex. So, if somebody, okay. yeah, okay. Alex can your slide, e yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Clara Muradkan. I am the CEO and co founder of ePave. ePave is a patented reflective pavement coating material that's specifically engineered to preserve asphalt and concrete while reducing global warming. Uh, what is the problem with asphalt? Asphalt oxidizes, it has lack of durability, it, ha it has very long road closure, becomes extremely costly, and has environmental impacts, such as adding to urban heat island and therefore adding to greenhouse gas emission. And also, asphalt has a ton of chemicals that is very toxic to health. What we have done with EPA, we've developed a high performance polymer based coating material that is very cost effective, it's durable, it reduces the maintenance cost, it has very minimum traffic disruption, you close to traffic, you open to traffic within one hour versus 24 hours or 20 hours for other products, and has um, environmental benefit. Uh, it decreases the urban heat island. How does it do this? It's a reflective coating. It reflects IR and absorbs UV. Therefore, it decreases the urban heat island. While decreasing the urban heat island, it also decreases the greenhouse gas emission and reduces the energy usage. One other thing that it does, it, it seals all the toxicity that it emits from asphalt. Who is this product for? This product can be used for public sector. It could be used for private sector. Um, any facility, outdoor facilities that has areas um, of asphalt or concrete, business campuses, school campuses, playgrounds, pedestrians, parking lots, roads, this product can be used. And um, uh, the, for the construction industry, it also includes architects, it includes engineers, and also includes uh, landscape designers. We pay um, is all about customizable colors that we can incorporate in the design stage of any project. Uh, EPA solution, uh, bring, um, uh, solution brings value by increasing the sustainability of infrastructure, by lowering the maintenance costs, decreasing energy usage, and enhancing health and wellness. Thank you so much for your time, and let's build a green economy. So if you have any questions, I would love to answer. Thank you. Um, so I see no questions yet, having been asked in the chat. Um, so yeah, what is what what does your competition look like? What are the alternatives for for a government who wants green roads? The the good the good news is that in the space of two payments, there are not very many competitors yet. This is a very new market, but um, there are uh, and we are able to differentiate from them because there are still polymer petroleum based. And, um, and some of them are acrylic based, but they're not able to be on roads. So the competition is also starting with us. So it's, it's like a good uh, place for competing. But as far as the preservation aspect of it, of course, we're, we're competing at, um, with slurries of the world, we're competing with microsurfaces of the world. Uh, so the good, the good news is that we have two spaces that we're competing with. Yeah, and how much does it cost? So, uh, so it varies. It, it all depends on the surface of a, a road. If the surface is in a fairly good condition and we're using only one sixteen of an inch of the product, this could last. Uh, the product could, uh, is only fifty cents per square feet. But if it is more, then you're doubling and tripling. It depends how many layers of the product you're using. So it's recommended that you use it once your road starts crumbling and 
it starts cracking. That's when you see the first sign of cracking. So you're saving growth. But the good news is because it's durable, the durability aspect of it, you save pretty much 50% on your maintenance costs. Yeah, and so, so normally what's the percentage of cost for the whole infrastructure? I'm sorry, what's the question? Yeah, so the, the, the cost increase percentage for the whole infrastructure when you start using this. So because every road has a maintenance plan attached to it, so it, it varies. So you pretty much, there, there could be someone that comes in with a product that's 30 cents per square feet, and then we come in for 50, 50 cents. So when you are looking at the maintenance, that's when we come in. We will be planned when a road is structured or when they construct a road, then they will have a maintenance plan, and that's when we come in. So in that sense, and then when we look at the life cycle cost of it, that you don't have to redo this every three to four years, then it becomes 50% saving that high, the maintenance cost is saved. Yeah. One more question from the audience. Uh, does it also reduce sound? I'm sorry, sound, what? Sound. So sound oh, from yeah. calls. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's an excellent question. I mean, um, so if, again, uh, because of the surface of the road, when you, so we put it on in Los Angeles on a, on a stretch of a, a highway. So my friend and I were driving and I told my friend, I said, when you're driving, be very careful because it's only a small stretch. And then, so she slowed down and I said, don't, don't slow down, don't slow down because we might hit traffic. But the minute we drove on it, it was very smooth because of the surface conditions, like driving on concrete, it becomes very smooth. So. Yes, I mean, we would like to say that it decreases the uh, noise, but it has, we don't have any proven data except us driving on, on the surface. Okay, well, good to hear. Uh, <laughs> and we have the final two companies. So um, the one we're going to listen to now is WePower from Lithuania. Uh, this is a blockchain-based green energy financing and trading platform uh, that is based in Lithuania, but already fully live in, on the other side of the world in Australia. So Nick, please uh, explain. Hi, hi everyone. Thank you, Julia, for the introduction. <laughs> yeah, we are uh, uh, we are headquartered in Lithuania, but with a commercial office in Australia. We're a company of 15 people currently. Uh, my name is Nikolai. So the energy system is changing, and more renewables are getting connected to the grid. the The way we buy and trade energy does not change. Uh, we power our goal is to facilitate energy transactions of any size directly with producers and maximize the practical value of sustainable energy. Complicated energy procurement process prevents companies from leveraging sustainable energy benefits, especially when it when the outcome of purchasing sustainable energy needs to be optimized between cheap, local, and green energy, uh, as it's currently centered only around the affordability of it. We power uh, provides. Uh, radically simplified energy procurement experience for all market participants, connecting them to enable direct energy transactions. We operate a direct marketplace through which we connect renewable energy producers with a pool of corporate and professional buyers, providing them with uh, uh, cost efficient solutions for buying, selling and managing their energy portfolios with never seen before flexibility. WePower provides cutting edge digital infrastructure, allowing larger pool of buyers to participate due to shared standardized process and infrastructure. We enable buyers with, with relatively small loads to participate in auctions and procure energy directly from renewable energy source. Standardized contracts and project curation significantly reduces the uh, transaction cost to buyers. And for larger, uh, for larger and the professional buyers, it provides the possibility to sell down their contracts to third parties via the platform secondary market and adjust and readjust their asset contract portfolio. Buyers can build portfolio of energy from multiple projects using progressive purchasing of the platform over three to seven years for better portfolio composition. We also work as platform as a service where we enable energy retailers to run their own marketplaces for their own clients offering many new uh, capabilities to design, buy, and sell direct energy contracts while making it easier and more flexible and less costly to manage for all the participants. Our first partner in Australia uses platform targeting relatively large customers with a consumption of 400 gigawatt hours per annum and above, uh, while our second deployment with a retailer focuses on buyers from SME to a consumption of around 20 gigawatt hours per annum. Uh, we have an ever-growing pool of energy uh, 
projects available for direct procurement in Australia, uh, across Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria, and Southern Australia. Uh, and that totals around one gigawatt of capacity to be sold over the next two to three years. Um, we have a pool of our own customers that use platform to acquire energy and that pool currently is around uh, uh, one terawatt hour of annual demand. And um, as I mentioned, we have two platform deployments uh, in Australia providing an end-to-end -end utility scale platform with a combined portfolio of 13 terawatt hours. We're currently entering European market and looking for innovator retailers looking to rapidly launch and test new cost-effective cost local sustainable energy projects in Europe. Uh, at the same time, we just recently launched our Thanks. Rate, pay round as well. Uh, there is one question from Thanks. the audience, but I'm not sure if I fully understand this. It, it says, is there any form or mode around wheat power? You also don't understand it? No. Uh, then, yeah, then we, no, we, we I ask for <laughs> clarification. Um, so how is your European traction going? Uh, we're currently uh, working with one retailer and uh, also in negotiating two additional deals alongside that to launch uh, WePower as okay. platform as a service. Thanks. Person. Then I think we have to move to the next one because there's not that much time left. Um, so we go to uh, Jump Watts from the US. Um, this is a smart service provider to micro mobility players, which is a booming sector uh, in many cities at the moment. Uh, so Brian Oval, can you explain us more? Yes, hello everyone. Uh, hopefully you guys are still with us. Uh, it's been great uh, seeing all the presentations up to now, so thank you for joining us. So as I said, uh, my name is Brian O'Valley. I'm the COO and co-founder of JumpWatts. At JumpWatts, we're developing a smart logistics technology to create order on city sidewalks and enable profitable operations of shared micromobility operations. Um, so imagine right now, you've probably seen the problem uh, if you live in a city that has micromobility, uh, micromobility and scooters and e-bikes have kind of taken over the sidewalk. You've maybe even tripped over these things. Uh, people love the utility of micromobility and what it can do for connecting cities when you're connecting and pairing it with mass transit, but they don't like the way they're seeing it implemented in cities today, which is hindering the growth and proliferation of the industry. So imagine for a moment uh, you're an operations manager for a shared micromobility operator like Bird or Lime or Tier. And uh, you love your job, but you're working 60 to 80 hours a week, and the entire time you're inundated with uh, uh, floods of operational staff trying to get get the vehicles where they need to be in the city. You're getting city complaints because of obstructions in the sidewalk. Um, you have you're getting fines and impound fees. All of these things are sucking up your profitability while you're trying just to get vehicles where they need to be in order to service the riders, in order in order to make sure that your permit stays intact to operate in the city, and you're trying to squeeze out a profit. Uh, the way that the model exists today it requires a one-to-one -one, um, operator to vehicle service task uh, ratio so everyone has to get into some kind of vehicle in order to go and physically touch and move these vehicles uh, even for very small micro movements where they just need to move it out of the sidewalk so at jump lots we've created a quick uh, add-on kit and the add-on kit comes uh, with uh, actuation devices and also um, GPS and IoT module in order to do remote repositioning. And, and it can do advanced movements as well, as, such as like picking up the vehicles remotely so that you can manage all fleet logistics from the comfort of your computer chair. Our goal is to increase the, the operator to task ratio from one to one to one to 500. So a remote operator can, uh, can passively manage up to 500 vehicles by themselves at any given time, given the spread and distribution of tasks that are required throughout the day. We have built a teleoperation portal in order to facilitate this service. So uh, operators, pro they pay a subscription access fee as well as fees for on a per task basis. And uh, we facilitate all of that through our, our operation portal and we have the staff required to uh, facilitate all those movements. So our goal is to enable micromobility in every city that wants it uh, and, and the way that it is implemented today that is that is hindering the growth and our goal is to eliminate that hindrance. Thank you. So how big is, is your market? How big is the market for your product? So uh, sure. we sized the, uh, the total market for that we have sized is about 4.7 billion uh, across all shared micromobility globally. Uh, currently, we are focused domestically here. We're based in Southern California. 
Uh, the, the market here in California is one of the largest domestic ones. So we're working with multiple cities right now. Uh, we've just signed an LOI uh, with the city of Mon uh, with, uh, to operate in Monrovia with a pilot that we're going to use with a partner that we have there called Panda Populous. And we're also in advanced discussions right now with uh, two other cities within Southern California uh, to bring micromobility to them. They currently do not have it, but they like the solution that we have and they believe that uh, by, by coupling micromobility with our solution, they can, they can actually open up the market uh, to pacify the community concerns and also bring in the utility of that kind of uh, service. So the cities are, are so far seeming to be interested in your solution. And what about the scooter operators? Uh, are they willing to co cooperate as well? To the operators, we've had successful pilots with Bird and Lime uh, previously, earlier this year, doing uh, manual logistics to understand the actual operations and pain points that they uh, live every day, and also from the fleet management aspects. So we, we've lived through the pain, and uh, so they are on board as long as we continue to have traction. Right now, they're looking for data sets, which is why we're conducting the pilots, in order to validate the impact of the system and also the reliability of our service. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah. We ran out of time. There are a few more questions in the chat box, so please can you answer them by chat. Um, in the meantime, then we move to the final pitch. Uh, hopefully, Alex Brill, um, so sound is working now. I'll turn my microphone. Is it working? Can you hear me? Or no? Doesn't work? Yes, I can hear you, but there seems to be a little bit of a time delay, but that should be fine when you are pitching. So, so please indeed do your pitch, um, and then no. I will not interrupt you. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Julia and SAP team for this great opportunity. I'm Alex Brill, co-founder of Solar Latam, a clean tech startup that has developed and launched the first solar energy platform available from South Florida, USA, to Patagonia, Argentina, and Chile, that enables home and business owners to switch to solar energy with just their smartphone. Our mission is clear. We're making, we're making going solar easy. How? Our mobile and desktop platform allows customers to design, quote, finance, and schedule their solar installation online without even needing to place a call. This past five years, we have studied how solar energy is offered and installed from Miami to Tierra del Fuego, Argentina, an experience that taught us a lot and revealed that there's much better ways to do it. Solar Latam has now streamlined this process into just three simple steps. You just go into our website, you insert your address, mark your route, insert your electricity bill information, and that's it. Now you just have to select the system type that suits you best. We got it covered from there. Our platform will help you and guide you to decide what system design better suits your roof and energy demand. Just pick the design you like, select and finance a uh, finance option that is most convenient to you and schedule your installation date. We cover all permits, we cover our permits, engineering, logistics, and procurement to our headquarters. The best part, you can track everything online. We mean everything, dates, status, and updates. Once it's installed, you'll be able to monitor the system itself online too. The platform also enables solar ambassadors to go hunting for new solar homes, as well as solar installing crews to register and serve through all the installations available in their service area. This means that now users have a better trustworthy and simple way to switch to clean energy. Also, the platform manages all commercial representatives and installation crews across Latin America and the US in the states we work in. What's next? Just visit the link in the slide uh, Julia just shared give it a try and switch to solar. If you're here, it's because you're conscious of what the world will look like if we don't take action. We're looking for partners and investors that believe in this path. We welcome them to join us in Solar Latam at our Series A fundraising round. Excuses are over, help us change the world one roof at a time. Thank you, Alex. Uh, so, are you mainly focused on, uh, on on households or on businesses? 
we are mainly now focused on households because due to COVID, uh, it has been the main market this, this month, but we work uh, both uh, markets, B2B and B2C. Uh, we believe that the, the platform works properly and suits uh, both clients uh, in the same way. So uh, also depends in, in which market you are. If it's you, Argentina, Chile, Panama, or the US, uh, there's better um, regulations or incentives towards companies or towards uh, households. So it depends also in the market, but we're trying to aim to the, to the households right now due to uh, the COVID reasons and the quarantine. And when are you uh, planning to expand to the US? Uh, we already are operating there. We have already oh, yeah. 10 projects yeah, working there in South Florida. We launched in June in the middle of uh, hurricane seasons uh, and COVID. So it was a huge challenge, but uh, we're doing great. So we're happy to share that. Well, perfect. Thank you so much. We, we ran out of time. So uh, everybody had five minutes, but we had a few technical issues here and there. Um, so I see most people are still here listening and some people have already dropped off. Um, but thank you very much. If there are any other questions that anyone have, uh, please approach these uh, interesting speakers through the, the networking platform and ask them uh, additional questions or let them know you're interested to invest. Thanks. Have a good uh, evening or morning or night or whatever it is in all of your countries. <coughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>